Hi, I'm Dr. Rachel Beaupre here with Dr. Frank Backwitz, and welcome to this edition of the STS 8 and 8 Critical Care Podcast. We would like to thank the STS and its Critical Care Committee for the opportunity to speak on this important post-operative topic and provide an overview of the management of post-cardiotomy temporary epicardial pacing in the ICU. Let's start out with a case scenario to frame how temporary epicardial pacing can be used to our advantage to improve patient outcomes. A 65-year-old woman went under underwent aortic valve replacement in a cabbage times two, A and V leads were placed in the operating room. On return to the ICU, her heart rate is 50 beats per minute and she is in a nodal rhythm. She has a low cardiac index and is requiring vasopressin support. How can we use her pacing wires to improve her post-operative hemodynamics? Now that we have a patient before us, we can use pacing for their benefit. We must first understand how to use the pacing box program its settings, and this video will provide a brief overview of how this can be done. This is one of the most common pacer boxes. You start by putting your A and V leads into the correct slots. I'm setting the rate to higher than the patient's intrinsic rate. I wanna make sure that I see pacing spikes and a correlating arterial deflection on the arterial line. The next thing I'm going to do is set the sensitivity here. I want it to be the most sensitive possible. So I'm going to turn all the way to the right, to the lowest millimeters. Next, I'm going to pick up the electrical capture and find the lowest amount of energy needed to produce a beat. Once I find that lowest level, I'm going to set it to twice that. I'll do that for both the A's and the B's. Last thing is to find and set your pacing mode. So go to mode selection. Here we're in DDD doing dual pacing. If you have an intact AV node, you can choose to pace them AAI. Um, and if there's issues with the AV node, you could choose to pace them VVI, which is ventricular early. Then you hit the lock so that no one can change your settings on accident. There's three major ways that pacing provides a benefit in the post-operative setting. First, pacing can be used as a form of electrical ionotropy. Increasing the heart rate directly increases cardiac output. In addition, an increased heart rate can also increase stroke volume by increasing myocardial tension. Restoring sinus rate and rhythm also can increase cardiac output by about 20% as it restores the atrial kick and optimizes atrial ventricular synchrony. In addition, temporary pacing can provide overdrive suppression of arrhythmias. By pacing the heart at a rate above the tachyarrhythmia, the negative effects of that arrhythmia can be suppressed. You can continue to overdrive suppress the rhythm until the appropriate native activity returns, either through self-resolution of the arrhythmia or until pharmacologic therapy kicks in. There are several different modes in which one can pace. We'll go over the three most common and appropriate ones to use in the post-operative setting. The three letters in the pacing mode each indicate a separate function. The first is the chamber being paced. The second is the chamber being sensed and the third denotes the pacer's response to what is being sensed. In AAI mode, the pacer both paces and senses the atria, but is inhibited by a sensed native atrial activity. This means if the heart has endogenous beats produced by the SA node, the pacer will not fire. The caveat to this is this mode cannot be used in atrial tachyarrhythmias or in patients with AV nodal blocks. As an AAI, which both paces, paces and senses both the atria, VVI does the same, only for ventricles. VVI can be used in any setting where the AV node conduction is blocked. It can also be used in bradycardias, sick sinus syndrome, or in atrial fibrillation and atrial flutters. However, given there is no atrial kick provided by this mode, it can decrease the cardiac output. In DDD, both chambers are being sensed and paced. In this mode, if atrial depolarization doesn't occur, it will wait for a sensed ventricular depolarization. If neither of these events occur, it will deliver energy to all chambers. Due to this, it can be used in nearly all cases. Unfortunately, temporary wires aren't impervious to malfunction. Thankfully, there are ways to troubleshoot malfunctioning wires and rescue them in order to prolong their use when needed for patient management. Here we provide a mini algorithm for bedside rescue of epicardial leads. First, it could be possible that one lead may have detached from the epicardium or have developed fibrosis, which is inhibiting de delivery of energy to the chamber. 
To test this, you can flip the hot and ground cable connections to the wires. If this doesn't restore function, there are two subsequent things that can be tried. First, a new lead can be placed in the subcontinuous tissue and connected to the ground. If that doesn't work, or if you need immediate emergent use of the pacer, you can use a, at the bedside a 16 to 18 gauge needle, which you place through the skin and then connect the metal part of that needle into the ground of cable connection. Lastly, if a lead is broken or fractured, the insulation can be stripped off the wire and the fractured part may be cut. Therefore, you can use the remaining exposed wire, which you can attach into the cable connections and rescue uh, your lead. Now back to our patient. Now that we've established a basic understanding of temporary epicardial pacing, let's apply it to our case. First, you connected the leads to the cables and then connected those to the pacing box. You set the pacer to DDD mode in this patient because you noticed the patient had a nodal block. Over the next few hours, the cardiac index has improved with pacing and in subsequent checks of the underlying rhythm, the patient has recovered their endogenous sinus rhythm. You can now place the pacer to a back up rate and prevent any emergencies should they can decompensate or lose their endogenous rhythm. Eventually, the patient's hemodynamics improve and you're able to wean off pressor support. Congratulations, you've now successfully used temporary pacing to positively affect a patient's outcome. Thank you for tuning into this edition of the STS Critical Care 8 and 8 series. Once again, we'd like to thank the STS for the opportunity to bring you this content, and we hope this presentation will be useful in your practice as well as a quick reference tool in the future. If you have any further questions, feel free to contact myself or Dr. Backwoods. Until the next time.